Today's program features Sheriff Lewis Evangelitis. Born in Worcester, raised and currently lives in Holden, graduated from UMass Amherst in 1983. That's long after I graduated. Received his JD degree from Temple Law School in 1987, and that's a very good law school. In 2002, he was elected to the Mass House of Representatives, defeating the Democratic incumbent by nearly 2,800 votes in a district which included several towns north and west of Worcester, the largest being Holden. Is that your largest town? Mm -hmm. yeah. It was. It was. Okay. So it became sheriff. It became sheriff. <laughs> right, this is 2002. 2010, he was elected Worcester County Sheriff in a district that has been held, had been held by the Democrats for years. I wonder how many years had they held that before you took it? Uh, maybe some of the audience remember, because I haven't found anybody that can remember how long it well, was. <laughs> let's just say a good 50 years. Uh, yeah, I was <laughs> longer than I've been alive, okay? In 2015, Governor Charlie Baker appointed him to the Massachusetts Port Authority Board of Directors. He was re-elected sheriff in 2016. He's now been, uh, since he was appointed to the board, he's been named chair of the, it's called Massport. Marty Martell, whom we all know was a friend and strong supporter of the sheriff. He also was a good friend and strong supporter of Bob Armstrong. We have him to thank for this program. Unfortunately, Marty died recently. If he were here today, he would be the one introducing the speaker. I give you Lou Evangelitis, Sheriff of Worcester County, and next door neighbor. This is where if you come up to the jail, you'll get a sense of what we do. But to let you know, we have, and I think there may be a slide before this, yeah. So we have the three prior roles of sheriff is to run the facility next to you, which is a house of correction and a jail. We have community corrections and we have community programs. And, and that's me. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so our, jail, our Worcester County House Correction is a jail. Now, we used to say 1,200 inmates. We have 1,200 on an average daily basis. We right now have about a little under 1,000 on an average daily basis. That's because of a lot of things going on right now, as you know, some of them with the criminal justice reform and some police activities on the streets and some of the, uh, and, and, and some of the diversion of people from incarceration. So our inmate population is now a little under 1,000. That's a, that, we were built for 800, so we're still overcrowding. Uh, and we're mandated to provide clothing, food, transportation, medical care. I always say we run a city up there, as you know, being our next door neighbor. And there's a difference between a house of correction and a jail. There's a house of correction are for sentenced inmates. In other words, you are, you, you've, you've been up there, perhaps you've been bailed out, perhaps you've been there, but you are sentenced to less than two and a half years. You go back to the house of correction to serve out the remainder of your sentence before you release back to the community. 90% of these inmates uh, are, have substance abuse problems, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And I want you to know the jail are people who are waiting trial. So there's some serious offenders up there, there are, but they're awaiting trial and if they get sentenced, they will go to state prison because those are felonies that require a much longer sentence. So, on our, so we have two different sides to our staff. We have a corrections department and a civilian staff. Corrections are deputies, captains, lieutenants, sergeants, correctional officers, which are the majority of our employees, over 300. Special services, canine services, I'll talk about some of these later. Civilian staff, I'm proud of the social work we do there too because as I said, we have to help rebuild these people when we get that opportunity. Not everybody wants to help themselves. Make no mistake about it, we don't coddle anybody up there. They're criminals, they serve their time, that's what they're gonna do. If they wanna meet us halfway, we will help them. We have social workers, teachers, doctors, nurses, psychologists, legal department, and counseling as well. Now. The first thing I do every year is swear in my deputies. Uh, that's a very um, specific authority I, I have as sheriff. It's something I honor, and it gives me the ability to deputize individuals with arrest authority and ability to carry firearms, and I only do that to those who work for me that have those requirements. We started the program teleconferencing. Uh, when I came in, we were the first sheriff to do it because I was a practicing lawyer for years. I made no sense to transport people to and from the jail on a regular basis. Some of them play games. They just want to get their bail reviewed. They file some nonsense motion just to get out of jail for the day. 
So we started working with the courts. For about $60,000, we implemented an inmate teleconferencing with the courts. They love it, we love it. It doesn't allow transportation of these folks. It's better safety and it saves a lot of money. And these are the transportation vans I'm sure you see around. And these are some of the staff with inmates at a graduation ceremony at one of our um, correctional um, community centers. So our basic retreating academy, we're in the middle of this now. I matter of fact, that's where I'm, I, gotta, I have to get back at a certain time pretty soon to meet with the, my last two recruits, but we have a very rigorous program for training our recruits. We have the highest standards in Massachusetts Corrections. I can't remember if it's in here, but I want you to know some of you were kind enough to reflect back on my first uh, runs for office. When I ran for sheriff, some of you may remember this, but you know, there was, there was a lot of years, a lot of decades, and, and the prior sheriffs were, were friends of mine, so I'm not trying to be critical, I'm just stating what I believe is an obvious fact, and that is that there was a lot of patronage and a lot of politics and a lot of nonsense up there. And frankly, it was about patronage, not about professionalism and ch turning people's lives around. So when I ran for sheriff, I talked to people in this county, and I knew they wanted, they knew this was an important place, and I knew they wanted somebody that would have some standards and that would not allow that, and I knew the easiest way to do it would be to do this. Two things I did. I joke with this. I'm joking now, okay, on my camera. I say they, throw, they should throw a parade for me every year up there, employees, because I was the first sheriff in Massachusetts history to say I will never take a campaign contribution from an employee or a spouse. <laughs> now, can you imagine that seems so obvious? Yeah. Can you imagine I was the first sheriff in Massachusetts to say that? Because people were hired because they made contributions. People were promoted on contributions. Yeah. Contributions ran that place, and that's a disgrace to the people who elect us and to the people in that facility and the community at large who should benefit from quality people being hired and quality people being promoted. No politics, no money, that's nonsense. I took it out. It shocked the place, to be honest, because they, they didn't like it, I suppose, but they knew no other way. I mean, it came down to work ethic and merit that was a little different. Come on, that's kind of funny, isn't it? I think it is. Funny in the sense that it would be surprising. But that wasn't how it was run. I'm not being critical of the people who worked it. That was just a culture for 50 years. Culture that I promised I'd break. So the first two things I did was I sent out an email on day one saying my campaign promise was this and I'm sticking with it. I will never accept a contribution from yourselves or your spouses. Nobody believed me. They all wondered how you really get the sheriff money. They found out soon enough, that's for real. Second thing I did, I raised the hiring standards. The highest in Massachusetts. The Department of Corrections pays $10,000 more for the same job. My standards are much higher than theirs. Why? Because I had to eliminate the practice of hiring patronage, cousins, uncles, legislators. I sent a letter out to the legislators saying I won't accept their letters anymore. That didn't go over too well. Um, but I did. And you know what? I used to be a legislator, and I'd be grateful if someone said to me, I don't want any recommendation letters, because then I could tell them the sheriff won't accept them. Do it on your own. But we raised the standards, so now you have to have a college degree and or have served your country to be hired by the West County Sheriff's Department. Imagine that? But those are the minimum standards. Then you have to do physical fitness and, 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 and written tests, and, and, and we do a psychological profile because we don't want inmates to be, have officers working with them who may be very well qualified but don't have the aptitude to work with an inmate population, and I didn't want to have those kind of lawsuits, so we did the psychological, and that, that usually eliminates about 10% of the people. That was a big step for us as well. So we did a lot of things to change the culture of the and the, this is an example of the classes. They are very, these are the best young people out there you'll ever imagine. This is just one of our classes. Um, mostly men. I love women recruits. We can't find enough. And when we find them, it's hard to retain them because they're in high demand. So if any of you are looking for employment, <laughs> the ladies on that tour, we might try to get you in with us. Um, so, you know, we know we're, you know, tough on crime, you know, smart on crime. And you can, you know, it's a cliche, but you know what? It's so true. Because at the end of the day, we have to work with these folks who want to work with us. We owe it to you, we owe it to our families, and we owe it to them. Because you know what, last time I checked, I tell everyone that works with us, I said, I don't have a robe. I didn't sit here walking around there with a robe. I mean, I think they've been judged already. Now it's time to say, serve your sentence, and if you want help, we'll help you. If you don't, that's your problem. Truthfully, I can't reach people who don't want to be reached. And we don't have the resources, as we said, or the time or the patience to work with people who are just jerking us around. So they can serve their sentence. There's nothing we can do. But we want to help change people, make it truly a house of correction. So 90% are, are incarcerated due to addictions to drugs and alcohol. And frankly, you know, we can talk about that maybe after if we have a few minutes because 
you know, it is the issue of our times. And I will say, as sheriff, um, I'm very proud to say when I ran for this job in 2010, I could feel the the wave that was hitting this country when it came to opioids and 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 those type of painkillers. And I knew it was being abused at a level that was bringing, unfortunately, people into the world of opioids, which ultimately ended up in heroin, which ultimately ended up in a lot of deaths. It was killing people inside the walls of this country, and it was frankly being produced within this country. Uh, and it was uh, there was a lot of issues that went along with it, but I could see it coming. So I'm proud of the fact to be sheriff. I've been going to. I'll talk a minute about my some of the programs we do, but. You know, when I ran for sheriff, I think people looked at it as, it as a job. Well, you know, I remember people first saying to me, don't do that, please. That place is horrible. You don't want to go there. And I took that as a compliment. I did. I mean, I, don't, I don't, didn't feel good to have people say, you're better than that. Do something else. Because I wanted to do this job. Because just because something was done one way for a long time doesn't mean it's always going to be done that way. And there are other sheriffs doing amazing things. And I said, I want to be one of those people. So we are, because of the confluence of timing and events, and you know, I mean, God, you ever heard the word Narcan? Yeah. I never heard the word Narcan when I was running for sheriff. Nobody mentioned it to me once. I haven't gone a day, probably because I say it like that every day, but you practically don't go a day without hearing about Narcan because there's so much opioids out there. There's so many overdoses. There's so much heroin. And I'm sure you remember, because we're probably, you guys are believe me, closer in age to me than a lot of groups I speak to. Um, but, you know, I say, I remember the 60s. Now, there are people who say, if you remember the 60s, you didn't do it right, okay? Now, um, we're taking notes on who's getting a good laugh here. But I, I remember the 60s because I was like one to eight, okay? So I was well behaved, but I remember them. But I remember starting school like in fifth and sixth grade and seeing those posters about heroin. Remember those, I mean, people used to, they had the guy pulling the rope and shooting it in his arm. I remember looking at that thinking, oh my God, like, I can't believe people did that. And I thought when I was in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, wow, well, remember that horrible epidemic of heroin back in the 60s? Thank God we'll never see that again. Well, it's back in full force. Yeah. And the reason I mention it is like, Sheriffs, we're in the middle of this battle. So instead of just being on the fringe, just being like people that incarcerate people and things, we are in the middle of one of the most important battles of our time. More people died in, in uh, addiction last year in America and overdoses than died in the entire Vietnam War. Think about that. More people, 57, 58,000 Americans died in Vietnam. We lost 70,000 Americans to opioids last year. We got a real problem, and we're not treating it like a war. We, when America puts us our head around a war that we are committed to win, we will win. I don't think we're quite there yet. I think we're still dancing around the issue. But we're getting there. But as sheriff, we're definitely in the conversation in a big way. So those are our substance abuse education programs. Anger management, relapse prevention, high set, which is the GED, which is the high school equivalency. As the superintendent mentioned, we're starting a serve safe program now. I mean, we just try to keep innovating, and we have no money. You know the Salter School down the road? Yeah. They, went, they went bankrupt. Yeah. Yeah. So we bought all their equipment for like $5,000, and we moved it up to the jail, and we started a program. The, the legislature wouldn't fund us. We wanted, they won't give us any money. So we did it on our own. So that's how we work. We do computer certification, work release, parenting, domestic violence. I could go on and on. Each of these programs, I could tell you stories and stories about what I've seen at the jail. But they're out there every day, good work being done. Uh, we have a lot written up. This is in the Worcester Business Journal. Turning topics into colleagues, bridges to college. We have a program with Mount Washington Community College where they actually train inmates for work. Uh, plastics industry jobs, you get a college credits while you're incarcerated. It's only people who are committed to the program do it. The professors come from Mount Washington. They love the program. They say these people, and I'll give you a funny story because it's really surprising. One of the first people I hired, when I was there as a teacher, came from the Providence Public Schools. And I asked them, I said, why do you want to come to the whole, you know, why do you want to come to the jail when you're in a public school system? He says, because I'm tired of teaching students that don't want to be there. Yeah. Oh. And I never thought to myself, oh my God, imagine that. <laughs> well, these folks want to be there because if they don't want to be there, they're not going to be in the class. Number one, it's a privilege to be in a class. And number two is if you're disruptive, you're out. So you want to be in that class, you take advantage of it, you've got opportunities. These folks are committed to get it done. And we try to do it through things like these type of programs. We're starting a, we have a program with community, Consigament Community College now where they're getting people prepped for college placement. So they come in and they do a training program to get people to take the pre-exam so they can determine what their levels are in mathematics and English and things like that. Um, and continuing to add additional classes through Quincy. And Maria, as the superintendent just mentioned, is coming up with a music program. We're trying any way we can to reach these folks. 
And we have prison ministry programs that have been extraordinary and really changed people's lives. So we try our best because that's our job. You know, the church department isn't about just handing our jobs to your friends, putting your feet up and calling it a day. It's about doing the really hard, gritty work of working with people who are criminals and, and many have a drug addiction and many have dysfunctionally grown up and trying to find a way to change their lives to make our whole community a better place. And it's really hard work. And somebody will ask me, so I'll say now, what's the recidivist rate? How many people who leave there come back? Probably about half. That's true. I mean, some, some programs we have are like in the teens. We know they work. We wish we had the budget to promote them better. Um, we just don't, so we work with what we've got. So the STOP program, this is one that's, a, if you come to the jail, you'll probably see it. It's a standalone building. It's where the women used to be. So some of you, when you were misbehaving, probably spent time in there. Maybe you can share some stories with us. Nobody wants to share. I checked you guys before I got there. I know a couple people were out there. But anyway, um, it's the old women's building. We don't have women anymore. They go to Chicopee because of overcrowding and things like that. They have a special building for, it's a whole facility they have for women in Chicopee. So we turn that into a STOP program, which is a substance treatment opportunity program. It's been nationally recognized. It's been written up. This was being written up in the Boston Globe. Um, it, it was an extraordinary story, but it's a six month inpatient treatment program. No other sheriff's department has anything like it. It's a long term recovery unit, about 36 beds. People support each other. It's my favorite place in the facility because those are the people who have been kind of, it's almost like you have to apply to get into a college to get in there. And when you get in there, they support each other. They've been fellow gang members that we can classify in a way to get in there. We'll work together to solve problems once they get in there. And I'll give you a quick example how it works. You're in the general population, just telling you how it works. You are Mr. Tough Guy. You gotta keep your persona, you know, the whole nonsense. You're not getting better because you can't let your guard down. Now, we have programs for those folks, and some of them take advantage of them, but too many of them have their guard down, guard up. But once they get to the, uh, oh, thank you. So, once you get to the uh, STOP program, you see people let their guards down, and they start realizing that I need to be myself, be a human, and help myself, and turn my life around, and they get supported by each other in this. So it's really extraordinary program to, to get a chance to see. So, I can decide you want on all these programs because I have a canine unit, for example. We have dogs at the jail and the key to jacks by a duke. We have some more. Um, this program started just so you know this guy, Nikita. He was our first dog. Now, when I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dog owner and I'm also like, you know, have a shelter dogs. And when I got to like the sheriff, we had about three or four dogs. You know, there was a search and rescue hound, there was some narcotics detection. They were all retiring. And with our budget, and I hate to keep talking budget, but it really drives our place. And I'm going to allow, I'm going to, that's the last thing I'm going to say about a budget, I promise. Just to let you know how frustrated I am, and I've been working on this for eight years, Middlesex County has fewer inmates than me today, and their budget's $78 million. Ours is 48. Why? They have 21 full-time teachers. I have six. They have 22 substance use counselors. I have seven. Why? Never got a straight answer on that. It's not political. I inherited it. We believe it's because Middlesex was a richer county when they were county government, and when they went over to state, they just kept going. So everybody was not funded equally, and Worcester County got really punished in this because I think our population went up, our services necessary went up, and maybe we didn't have people fighting for these programs because, frankly, the sheriff of Middlesex County, uh, I'm going to say something very kind of cruel and cold, but it's a fact, um, that, that office has always been very political, and they probably did a lot of favors for the legislator, and that sheriff killed himself. So things were not good there, but they were able to get a big budget. And in Hamden County, the sheriff out there did an extraordinary job, 35 years head start on me, and he was the one who recognized the need for these programs, and he worked with the legislature in the 80s and 90s when there was a lot of money going into corrections to build up his budget, while Worcester County was, frankly, patriotic of politics, and I wouldn't have given him any more money myself. So we fell further behind, and then I get elected, and I'm 20 million behind, and I have, every year they've given the sheriffs 1% more. That's it. So every year I fall further behind the Middlesex counties and the Hamden counties, and I've had studies done that show we're significantly underfunded, and for two years running, the Senate had five million more in our budget than they had for other sheriff's departments, but at the end of the day, they balked and they gave us nothing. So I just have to do what I gotta do, 
And that's why Dave said we're running a $55 million. We have a supplemental budget we have to ask the legislature for because I can't operate on the money they give us. I can't even do it. Now, does that feel right? It feels wrong. It is wrong. But what am I going to do? Am I going to fire all my teachers and substitute counselors and say to the legislature, you win, we'll do nothing, even though I'm mandated to. So I just have to do what I got to do, and someday it's going to be bad because the economy will turn, there won't be any money, and I'm stuck. But I don't know what to do anymore. I'm very frustrated by this. We're not giving up our dogs. I'm not going to have a kid disappear. We don't have a blood happen. I'm not going to have, you know, have to call the state police or some police department in the county to get narcotics dogs, because I'm in jail. I need dogs. So we found a place we could adopt dogs from, a shelter. The, the Nikita came from a uh, Sterling Animal Shelter. <laughs> and we adopted him for free. And we found a training program in Plymouth to train him for free. And he became the most sophisticated narcotics detection dog in the county's history. And he cost us a grand total of zero dollars and zero cents. And we have a great uh, vet down in Holden, my old hometown, who provides all the services for free. So, and we've had, uh, I think we have something in here, but, so we've been able to build this program with those type of dogs. And this guy became the most famous guy in the department because he became a national TV star. Uh, Kim, who does my communications direction, sent the story out, it went viral. People love dogs, they love a story like this. It was picked up by a TV show called uh, uh, Shelter, Me. Shelter Me. And they ran it on national TV. We went to Los Angeles with the dog and we, had a, we walked the red carpet in Hollywood. I'm not joking. Um, the reason you might not have seen the show is it ran on national TV the same time as the Patriots Jets game. <laughs> I think a lot of people were watching the Pats game that Sunday afternoon. But nonetheless, it ran nationally and it was a big deal for us. And it showed us in the greatest light possible. And now we've continued to adopt other dogs. And there's Duke. This guy, you won't read about what he does because it's privileged and it's confidential. But this guy saves lives. He was put on to work just this week on a search and recovery. We don't publicize it because it's personal. You know, if a kid disappears, kid's got problems from a family, we don't advertise that. We just go get them. But this guy's an incredible dog. And, and, and this is the Holden Women's Club back in my hometown. I see a lot of friendly faces in here. Um, this is the Holden Women's Club. This is just an example of how this works. The women there said, we want to help your dog. We have mon money we'd like to distribute. We bought a vest for your dog. So if he's working in the community, he wants to be safe. They provided him a vest. They did that for us, $1,000 vest. That's the type of response the community has given us to this one program of dogs. So the, so the canine, Nikita, this is what I told you, was on the national TV show, Shelter Me. We went on uh, Sutton High School. We, we put a presentation on there. Here he was at the House of Correction, and um, there he was, the PBS series detailing canine and Massachusetts shelter dogs with the county's department, uh, national shelter. Now there he was, the first dog, first animal to be uh, profiled as the hometown hero of the year. Not me, not a person, a dog. And uh, we're really proud of that, that, uh, that he uh, was able to do that. So there he was, he got a big head, started to get a little lazy, you know, of course. But we, we kept him on the job. So Project Good Dog is another one. Imagine this for a minute. Nothing. And you'll see this program if you come to the jail. It's extraordinary. But we also started, we were looking for shelter animals. And some of you are probably familiar with the Needs Program in Princeton. Yeah. First thing I did, well, not one of, one of the first things I did after being elected is I sat down with Needs and said, hey, let's bring dogs to the facility. I know there's some therapeutic value. Unfortunately, I couldn't partner with Needs because they need about a two-year commitment for an inmate because they train people for disabled veterans and things like that. We couldn't match. So we kept plugging away and we finally found a, a shelter that we could work with that brings dogs to the jail. They train our inmates, because our inmates have the one thing a lot of people don't have, and that's time. And this is the work release building. This is the building of our lowest security inmates. These are inmates who have been well behaved, nonviolent defenders. They're serving time. We will match them up with a dog if they want to be matched up. We have usually four dogs at a time. They're up there. This program cost, again, zero dollars and zero cents. The, 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 they bring the dog source for free, they train them for free, they give us the food, and our inmates have a dog that live with them in their cell um, with, their, with a backup trainer. And you should see their bonding between these dogs and these trainers. And we actually had a one year, I don't know if it's in here, um, we had a one year anniversary of Project Good Dog. I tell you, channel four, five, seven, everybody in Boston came out. It was a huge celebration. We had 23 dogs. All the owners came back. This was one of our inmates, still there. That was his dog. Uh, this, again, was a, another one of our dogs that came back, uh, probably the owner and the trainer. So 
We had a great celebration. We're way past 70 dogs now. Every one has been adopted. The first eight were by our staff. Imagine that, like our staff would see them and says, who's got that dog? Well, nobody yet. I'd like to adopt them. And yeah. it's been a really great program for us. So two and a half years later, our inmates and staff benefit. 90 inmates have been participating in the program. Medical staff have said that mental health, anger, and aggression have all improved in the inmates. They're, they bonded, uh, some of them, I had one inmate, he actually, you know, has like pictures of the dogs on his wall, like his own kids. So, you know, they change as people, they have a sense of, uh, of an emotional attachment while they're in there, and they change as people. They also uh, change the culture of the place. The pressure goes down, the inmates are better behaved, the officers love the program, and how about this, the, the recidivist rate of these people is only 18% participate in the program. That's pretty darn good for a program that doesn't cost you a nickel. And that's the way we try to run the place. So we also re-enter inmates into community correction centers. You know, these are, these are um, there's one in Fitchburg, there's one in Worcester, there's one in Webster. And frankly, I wasn't real familiar with them when I ran, but I was very keenly aware of what they could do. Probably the future of corrections. In other words, don't incarcerate someone, you know, 24-7, costing us $50,000 a year. We can divert people who are non-violent offenders, non-gun charges, into a day reporting center where you get drug tested daily, the courts, the probation, and the sheriff's department work together, but we run the offices. And in those offices, we drug test you, but we also offer you programming, education, substance abuse, resume writing, things like that. Cost us $4,000 a year. If you screw up and you test positive, you go back before the judge, and then you can end up back in prison. But the point is, you learn a lot fewer bad habits living at home, you feed yourself, you clothe yourself, and you also are held accountable in a way that makes sense. And I've really invested a lot of money and time into these programs. And as I mentioned, we have these three centers. Those are what we do, the testing, the vote training and such. We have them, as I mentioned, in Worcester, Fitchburg, and Webster. Um, and that's the first ever one in Worcester. And in, in Webster is a little different model that where we work. Uh, differently with in response to the community's needs and it's a really effective center. So the, as I mentioned there, there's the three of them. I, I want to move on because I, I have a lot I can do here but first uh, ever a after incarceration support center. Again I went up to Hamden County well with their 80 million dollars they probably do more than we do. So one of the things I was most impressed with is they have an after incarceration support center. You get released from prison, the wheels fall off, you had a place to live, you get kicked out, you lose your job, what do you do? Where do, you, where do you go? Well, some people don't know, so they go back to their old ways, but we want to let them know we have an after-incarceration support center, which we open for free. Uh, we get donated space downtown Worcester. We let everybody know who gets released that there's a person there that can help you. Now there's two. We got a grant to hire the people to do it, and we started this. I went to Springfield. They had a whole building in downtown Springfield called after-incarceration support center. 25 employees, all of them had cars. They bring in the registry of motor vehicles, medical providers. I'm like, why can't we have anything like this? <laughs> Nothing. So you had to start somewhere. We started this. We now have three people working there um, because of the needs in this. So this we have a woman who works exclusively with the women in Chicopee. So we, we kind of migrated into a broader system, way below other counties, but at least we're doing something. And the final part is we have community corrections programs, community programs where we send inmates out in the community to do work, you know? The, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, inmates have committed crimes, they gotta pay their debt to society, but some of them who are, you know, lower level inmates may want to learn some skills, give back to the community. We find a small subset of those people in our work release building. We have maybe 15 or 20 inmates at any given time in this program. They go out every single day. If I brought you the list, it's on my desk, I, I meant to bring it. It'll tell you exactly where the inmates are today. I know they're at St. Anne's Food Pantry in Shrewsbury. You might think, Shrewsbury? Yeah, Shrewsbury. They have a food pantry there. They need help getting the boxes ready to distribute food to needy families in that community. Our inmates go and they, they pack all the boxes for them. They do it twice a month. Um, we, we clean up uh, you know, cemeteries before Memorial Day. We paint uh, senior centers. We, we do whatever work you need to be done. Um, and you know what I love about this program? Probably getting here says, you know, we have inmate work crews, over a thousand projects completed. We're well over that now. Over seven million, we're up into nine million taxpayer money saved. It's about a million dollars a year. I've been sheriff for nine years. And the inmates learn re-entry skills. So I say we give back fire stations, schools, libraries, police stations, local support. You can see all the work that gets done here. Look, I'm proud of the fact we promote these programs because we want the community to know what we're doing. You know, I promised that would be, you know, as my kids remind me, Dad, Dad, you're the new kind of sheriff. You remember, that was my slogan. But I wanted to be a new kind of sheriff. I didn't want to be the old kind of sheriff. I ran on being a community sheriff, 
And that's what I try to do. So we're proud of the promotion of the work that these inmates do. That was at the Ecotarium. Um, we have probably a thousand stories about this. The community love it, and it benefits a lot of people. I'm going to go back a second, because I want to tell you one quick story. The whole program, in my, my estimation, uh, is summed up by one inmate. And remember, these are people who have, you know, go, you're putting them to work, and you're getting them to give back to the community. But one inmate, I said, how are you doing this program? He said, Sheriff, I want to thank you for letting me be in this program. I said, why is that? He goes, because I never had a job in my life. I grew up in the city, I didn't have a job, I hung out with the wrong people, and I came here and you gave me an opportunity. And I get up every day and I go to work, and I have the first time in my life, Sheriff, these are the words he said, I have dignity. I have self-respect. I actually know what it feels like to do a good day's work. And when I get out of here, I don't want to go back to my old ways. I want my family and my loved ones to be proud of me, and I want to I understand what now it means to be a fulfilled person by working. Never forget that. So imagine a program that said, now this is a rhetorical question, but I'm going to say it twice because it always missed some people miss it the first time. Can you name me another government program that saves you millions of dollars and turns people's lives around? I'm going to repeat it. Not spent. Saves you millions of dollars, turns people's lives around while they do it. It's a pretty incredible program. And I tripled the size of that, then quadrupled the size of that program when I got there. It was barely hanging on. I don't know why. And I was like, why aren't we doing this more? So we tripled the size without, and then quadrupled. And we had to make sure that all the inmates in it were classified properly. That's the key. You can't put anybody in there who doesn't belong in that program. That could be a real problem. You know, something else we noticed, again, things we do to give back. There was a big graffiti problem in the city of Worcester about five years ago, and they had no way to remove it. I remember they were citing businesses, remove your graffiti, I'm going to fine you. I went to a couple of those meetings, I said, well, can I help? So we ended up buying a graffiti removal truck, and we were able to train some of our officers to go out with inmates, and we will remove graffiti from anybody who gets hit with graffiti, whether it be private business or public, because graffiti can be gang taggings, it can be a safety issue, and as you know, the old window pane syndrome, once you don't stay on top of it, it starts spreading like a weed. So we offer these services throughout the county. Some communities have been very big on us doing it. Gardner, for example, Lemonster, huge uh, requests through them. Clinton, my God, we did 20 sites in one day, I think, for Clinton. So it's out there, a lot of communities are taking advantage of it. So the committee programs, these are, this is, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, one of my most heartfelt feelings about giving back in this community is I wanted to go out and talk to the young people, you know? And I can tell you this, we started this program, I was the only sheriff in America doing it called Face to Face. We go into the schools and we talk to the students, mostly middle schoolers and high schoolers. My favorite ages was seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. You talk to those young people and I go in there face to face with them and we talk about the impact of drugs and alcohol, the choices they make matter. And I go through, I show a lot of videos, I walk through the crowd, we talk, it's not a lecture. It's an interactive presentation. You know, we put this on now in front of like 400,000 students, me personally. And you know, if you have a child or grandchild in the school systems or Worcester County, chances are I've been in front of them with this program and I'm really proud of it. It has an impact. It doesn't solve a problem, of course, but it can't hurt. And the schools tell me you're right in line with our health curriculums. I'll never forget, I was at my daughter's middle, back in middle school, so that was a while ago and she was playing a team from a community that I had recently been to. I didn't realize it, and all the kids came running up to me. I didn't know what they were doing. And they said, you came to us with that program last week. We're still talking about it and what an impact it had, and you really made us think twice about what drugs can do to you. Because young people, they don't know, they don't, I'll give you an example. Everybody knows the myths about drugs, yeah. but nobody knows the facts. I'll give you a myth. Now, this thing with marijuana being legalized is a little more problematic, but there's an old myth that marijuana is an herb, right? It's weed, it's roads, it's natural, it's from the earth. There's nothing wrong with it, it can't hurt you, right? Come on, let's smoke a little weed. Well, heroin and, and cocaine are just as natural as marijuana. Never heard me talk about how wonderful heroin and cocaine is safe they are. Of course they're not. That's a nonsensical argument. Or the prescription pain medication is a doc, it's a medical issue. They're safe. These are, these are myths that people believe. So we talk about the myths and facts and try to get through to people. We have Eminem, uh, Lindsay Lohan, we have all these videos. It's kind of fun, but I try to get the point across. And we've been, as I mentioned, 400,000 students. So you name the school, we've been there. Uh, I finish with this. A lot of the young people today, I'm not going to be able to get through showing them, telling them the myths and facts. I might get through to them when I start talking to them about 
how it can negatively impact your life and your body and things. But I figured, you know, at the end of the day, I go for their vanity. You know, they want to look good. So I say to them, you know what? Let me show you some people. And I have so many of these you can't believe, but let me give you a taste of it. Yeah. So, yeah. It might not work. This is a PDF, not a PowerPoint. Oh. So it's not probably going to show the after. Oh. Just so you know. Oh, there it is. Oh. So <laughs> that's the same lady two and a half years later. You should hear the young kids. Oh, they gasp. You know, I'm trying to show them. This is what happens to people. Here's a guy. Look at him a few years later. And we have people in our jail. Look, look at this girl. Look how sad she looks in this picture. You know, this is what drugs. This is the face of drugs. These people are not in a good place. And we also offer a scared straight community program. Uh, ironically, with our little budget, we were able to offer one of the best scared straight programs in the, in the state. And frankly, people started calling us from all over, including New Hampshire, to bring their families down. We actually had to start calling it back a little because we can't give them that often. But we do offer them for families, believe me. I wouldn't be shocked if some of you would have a family member that might need someday to come into this. I've had my own family, okay? It's just a way to introduce people to the criminal justice system in a way that says, this is where you're headed. You better think about where you're going and the choices you're making. Because I want to tell you what I tell the kids when I talk to them about drugs. You want to know the easiest way to prove Let me give you this. I'll tell you this story. 15 seconds, I'm going to sum up the life story of almost every inmate I've met in that jail. 15 seconds. You have the time I can, which usually does it. Well, the drama, I have my phone. But I say this, middle of high school, started doing drugs, got addicted, so I stole from my family. So I stole from him so many times, they kicked me out. So I moved in with my friend, stole from him to feed my addiction, till he got sick and kicked me out. So I went across the street, I broke into a neighbor's house, and I got arrested, and I ended up in prison. 11 seconds. That was 11 seconds, okay? Imagine I told a life story. Now, let me tell you something funny. I swear to God. One guy I told the story to at the jail. I was in a group of people. I told them what I'm doing. They're like, that's great, Sheriff. I wish someone would come to our school. I've shown them the program. One guy raises his hand, now, Sheriff, that's not what happened to me. Well, how, how's that different? I swear to God, one guy said, I stole from my grandparents, not my parents. Hmm? Yeah. One guy said, I didn't break into a house across the street. I went downtown and I broke into cars. No, seriously. That's what we're talking about here. So, you know, we try to... We try to let people know that you know the easiest way to get incarcerated is to start down the road with drugs and alcohol. Because if you don't get on drugs and alcohol, your chances of going to prison probably drop 90%. That's a pretty powerful message. Think about that. 90%. And this is the last uh, big initiative we started. Vanessa Marcotte was that young jogger that was murdered in Princeton about two years ago. And you know, we hit very close to home because I have daughters about her age, and you know, I'm from Holden, but Princeton was part of my legislative district. And, I'm very close to that community. So it hit closer to home than maybe it would have otherwise, but I just think hopefully, no matter where it happened, it would have resulted in the same thing. But the Mark Art Foundation, we started a conversation, and they, we decided that maybe we could help. And what we do with them now is we offer free self-defense classes to women across Worcester County, and it's taught by our women correctional officers. It's, it's, a, it's an event, I say free of charge, we charge like 10 bucks because the first time we did it, we had like six no-shows. And we thought, well, let's at least charge people 10 bucks, we'll give them a t-shirt. It's not to make money, it's just to make sure that every seat is taken because you learn in two hours, you learn not, you don't learn, you know, be a karate expert, but in two hours you can learn how to survive an attack. And that's what it's about. So you learn situational awareness, where am I, who's around me, before you leave home, let people know where you're going, there's apps for your phone. Also, don't put two earbuds in, one earbud, try to be with another person, and then be aware of what's around you. Even if you're walking back to your car from the supermarket, look around. No one's going to hurt you if they're not within 20 feet of you. Inside your car. What's that? Look inside your car. Look inside your car. I mean, we teach all the tricks you need to do to kind of protect yourself. I'll give you one example. This sometimes doesn't come out. It depends on the presentation. But I told my daughter, just got a car recently, and I said, anybody who gets in your car and they have a firearm, you know what you do? You take that car and you drive it right into the first thing you see. You do not leave with that person with a gun on you. Because your chances of surviving drop dramatically once you get they get away with you. You take that car and you drive it right into the first car you see, first building you see, and that person is going to get the hell and run out of there. That's what you do. But who thinks of such things, you know? But we teach things on, you know, if a woman gets grabbed by a ponytail, how she can move, maneuver. You get a sense of situational awareness and you learn how to survive an attack. And you know what? I can't even put a price tag on that. These classes have been unbelievably well received. I think we've done it four, we only started last year. We've already done it four times. We're trying to do one a quarter and we have another one scheduled coming up. So we're very proud of, I'm very proud of it personally. met a lot to me. As a matter of fact, I don't know why I'm saying this per se, but the first time we did this wasn't Vanessa's hometown. And I actually, I actually broke down just 
expressing what this program meant to me. It hit me that close. And I just believe we, we can save lives with this program. It's incredible. So very proud of it. Um, so the, the, the agriculture program, right here on cue. Um, when I got up there, we had no farming going on. You know, we sit in a pretty bucolic area, you know, except for what we talked about earlier. It's a pretty nice area, beautiful, 300 acres. I'm like, why aren't we farming this land? So we started to do it, and it's ex exploded in the sense of we started with 10 acres, we're up to 14. We got about, we just distributed, Kim, was it actually, Joe, Joe, Joe does the distributions. Kim, how many pounds did we distribute yeah. just yesterday? What was it, Joe, do you remember? Over 12,000 pounds. I bought 1,000 myself. Just yeah. Me. Yeah. Just Joe. Look how big his arms are. I mean, that's, now you know what to do. Wait. But, um, no, but Joe, Kim is my communication director. Joe really is the head of the, the community outreach as far as distributions, working with senior centers. And Joe knows all the, all the people at the senior centers and the community needs. And he goes out there daily during this time of year, distributing hundreds, thousands of pounds yesterday. Imagine this is fresh, organic food grown at the jail by inmates. Uh, this guy, for example, was on the New England Patriots practice squad. He was from Boston. He made some bad mistakes, but he loved the farming program. A lot of the guys work out there. I'll tell you something funny about the farming program. We first started it, you know, we noticed that the young people, they, this is how they swear to you, you're going to laugh. Young people, they put a seed in the ground, they come back the next day, where's the plant? Yeah. <laughs> where's the plant? No, seriously. Because they, they want to paint a wall, they walk away, they look at their job, they know they did it. They don't have the patience. We found the older inmates, meaning 30s, 40s, 50s, they enjoy the farming program more, so the inmates that want to give back to the community, classified appropriately, can work the farm. And it has been unbelievably successful, and, I, and I'm going to add a note to this. There was a guy named Dave Callagher. He was a lieutenant at the jail, and he was my partner. When I started, we want to get this program up, he said to me, can I do it? I love farming. I used to do it at the jail. I want to do it again. And I said, absolutely. And boy, did he give his heart and soul to this program. And he retired about two years ago. And he said, can I continue as a part-time employee just to oversee the farm? And we were more than grateful that he did it. Because think about this. Again, back to my favorite part of these presentations. We used to pay $900 for seed. We got it down to under $400. So for about $375, it's a pretty good return when we save the jail $30,000 a year and the inmates get to eat organic food and we distribute tens of thousands of pounds to food pantries across the county. And the food pantries tell us, Sheriff, you have no idea. You're bringing medicine to people who have mostly just eaten canned goods. You're bringing fresh, organic vegetables to people who have never had them. And they take them out by the crate. Now, Joe, you see it regularly, right? I mean, yeah. what, what do you hear out there? I, they, when they see me coming, they applaud. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we don't do that at the jail, by the way. We, 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 they are applauding. <laughs> But that's, that's sincere gratitude. I mean it, gratitude for what we do. And Joe is the person that gets to do that, and he does it so well. We're so appreciative of it. Uh, and Kim helps promote the program for us. We go off in times we take pictures like this, and we distribute the, as you'll see here, um, you know, at the end of the year, we, we distribute pumpkins, too. Um, I'll tell you a little funny story. And by the way, we do all that, I said, for, for very short money, about $375. Um, the end of the year, we do a pumpkin grow, and we distribute those, uh, mostly in the fall, of course, Two places that would beautify senior centers and things. I'll tell you a funny story. The first year we did this, no lie, somebody stole 100 pumpkins. Oh, no. <laughs> Can you imagine? They're, you know, because they were growing out on the main street and we don't have fencing around it. And one day 100 pumpkins disappeared. That was the only time it happened, but I thought that was kind of ironic for a jail to have someone steal our pumpkins. Um, yeah. So, you know, we got other things. I actually have people that are meeting me in my office at 10.30, now it's 10.35, but we're all, I think we're almost done. Another incredible program we got. I have a guy that I don't know how I'm so blessed to have him in, in our orbit, but he has a technology that I truly believe is possibly billion dollar technology, and it could change the way agriculture works in this country, and it's through a Cornell Institute. He's a partner. They grow these, uh, these, these vegetables, and it's not called hydroponics, Kim. They call it a terraponics. It's organically grown because it's grown in soil, but it's a 24-7 growing cycle. They do about 18 days of light, seven hours of darkness. They grow a full head of lettuce, tomatoes, unique cucumbers, 28 days. And they recycle the, the dirt, so they constantly they recycle it. Re so it's an extraordinary program. He wants us to be the prototype for jails across this country. This is being used everywhere now. He just signed Boston College, Boston University, major hospitals, <laughs> restaurants. I mean, imagine having fresh-grown uh, organic uh, spices and things, or you know, things like that. 
this is unbelievable. And he, the dream is to imagine you could feed the whole city of New York City with a skyscraper. You could have a skyscraper and you could grow so many fruit and vegetables, mostly vegetables, in a 28 day growth cycle. Well, we're blessed to have that program at the jail. And frankly, we haven't even publicized it yet because we want to get it to the place where it's extraordinary. Maybe a business for inmates who can make juices or something. Like, there's a lot of potential for this, but we're still working on it. But we've been doing it for about a year now. It's really exciting. And you may have seen or heard of the horses. Oh, yes. Yes. Hopefully that's a little more pleasant than other sounds. But that was the, the city of Worcester has wanted a mounted unit. You know, mounted police, horses, animals, they break down the barriers between law enforcement and communities. And it would also help the safety of the, the community, both the police and the community at large, to have a vantage point from a horse. But they had nowhere to house them. They didn't have anywhere to do it. They needed a million dollars. So the city manager called me and said, can you help? I know you had horses there at one time. We did, a long time ago. But we were able to retrofit the barn uh, for about $20,000 and a lot of inmate labor, supervised by some of our extraordinary staff who were carpenters. And we rebuilt that whole darn thing, and we got four horses in there. And what's great about it is the inmates also learn in the rehabilitation process. The, the, the patients loving care. They do the mucking of the stalls, and the recidivist rate has dropped for those inmates involved in that program as well. So we're really proud of that. And the final thing we have is our charity association. It's not the Sheriff's Department. It's the Reserve Deputy Sheriff's Association. It's a charity. Uh, I actually, we had it existing. Um, we wanted to change it a little. There's a lot of people, frankly, who are thinking maybe this is their chance to get a badge in law enforcement. I want to make it about charity and giving back. So we made everybody reapply. We had to kick some people out. Unfortunately, they didn't meet our criteria of background checks. But we've, we've really focused this on being a productive, charitable institution to help the community. We do food drive where we give 25 tons of food to the community over Thanksgiving. We work mostly with the uh, Friendly House in Worcester. We do the winter coat drive where we just started. So believe me, every year you think, well, they can't be any more neat out there. And there is. And as one young girl said to me once, thank you, Sheriff, this is so much more than a coat. And I didn't realize that she was actually wearing it inside her home because they couldn't afford to heat the house. So there's a lot of need out there in our community. And thanks to the people like you who are out there and this association, we're able to give back so much to the community. And our big event is the senior picnic. Anybody go this year? We have it at uh, SAC Park in Shrewsbury. We have it every year. There you go. So it's a big event. I mean, really big. Um, and it's about a thousand plus seniors and we have a free uh, day together where we serve a meal and bingo and have a lot of fun and we do it every year. As you can see the crowd's enormous. We started with 300 people. We've sort of done too good of a job and more people come every single year. I keep telling Kevin, come on, let's, let's ramp it down a little. But she won't do it. She won't listen. She keeps making it better. So it's a great event and we're really proud of it. And we started again, I keep forgetting, we started a skate night where we bring a lot of kids who've never had a chance to skate before at the Boys and Girls Club and the Guild of St. Agnes. We bring them, again, community partner, we'll bust them down there for free. We give them an opportunity to skate with the, with, with the, uh, with, for the Friend of the House Guild of St. Agnes, the Boys and Girls Club of Worcester. Uh, it's along with the railers. They help us, uh, they donate their, their rink time. Have anybody been to that rink down there? It's the practice rink, not the DCU Center, but the practice rink. Um, that's the bank uh, uh, um, right thing built down right off of Harding Street. And these are the charitable organizations. It's a small sample of who we contribute to. Family Services, Women in Criminal Justice, Central Mass Chief Police, 1540, Armed Forces, down to Gilda St. Agnes, uh, Mass State Police Boxing Team, Water Farm Preservation. You name it, we try to give to people in the community who need help. Um, that's, our, that's uh, some of the volunteers at our event. That senior picnic takes 200 volunteers. Um, and back to our, this is our oldest facility. This is the new building that's being broken ground on. That's what it's going to look like. I'm done now. We thank the chair for coming. You now see why he's able to win elections against Democrats.